Good morning, everyone. My name is Tahia Maro, and I'm here with Christopher Peterson. We are going to be talking about the book that Christopher and I put together and wrote for you all. It is called Resilience. Let me show you the cover of that book. And today's conversation is going to be about the first chapter in the book. This is a book of poetry, but it's also a manual slash kind of textbook slash journal. And so we're going to talk about each chapter in each episode. And so today we're going to be starting with um, introducing ourselves a little bit and then diving into chapter one. So Christopher, please, can you tell folks um, how you came into poetry? Just tell us a little bit about your foray into poetry. Uh, junior year high school, um, I was assigned to write a sonnet after reading the play by William Shakespeare. Um, like looking at you. <laughs> um, if you can look at the camera, you can see yeah, yeah. all the time. It's all good. And um, reading Macbeth by William Shakespeare. Okay, write a poem about love. Okay, sure, I could write. I think I could write. I think I could write. Next day, I, next day I came back with one. She's like, well, write another one about after love. And Next thing I know, I think I had a little talent on my hands, wrote an extra kind of poem, and uh, to this day, probably close to 10,000 poems later, still looking for that perfect poem, but knowing also knowing not, not, not going to be able to write that perfect poem and just keeping it as the motivation factor to just keep writing. Let me be brave in the attempt. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. consistently brave. All right. Well, Christopher, I think you're not the first poet to be inspired by the bard, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Try to find a, a, a path through to your voice in that way. Yep. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my story, too, relative yep. to this topic of resilience. Um, so we're going to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit, just sharing our experiences of resilience. I am also a writer, as you can see by my sign on my above my desk, writing begets writing. Um, but aside from that, <clears throat> I want to share with everyone that right now I am in a, um, a, not a fight, but I'm working through a diagnosis of stage four cancer. And so resilience is a very big theme for me right now, working on that and, and working with that. And Christopher has had his share of physical challenges in his life as well. And so we're going to kind of just um, poke at that or touch on to that in terms of our personal experience as we do talk a little bit about chapter one, which is about acceptance. And that's a really key part of resilience is acceptance. So Christopher, I'm going to ask you to please give us a quick sort of, well, maybe not quick, but can you tell uh, folks a little bit about the physical challenges that you had to endure as you navigated the road through the different therapies and treatments that address the disabilities that you were identified as having when you were born and when you were younger? Um, well, um, pure resilience is, I mean, I think that the word hits the nail in the coffin and here I am busting through the coffin. So whatever. Um, birth, I was told to just swell up and just die off and some great force other within myself, probably the creation of myself said, yeah, this is not your destiny. Let's get you a tracheotomy. And next thing I know, I'm here 42, almost 42 years later, inspiring, um, been constantly discriminated against because of my obvious looks, um, uh, just trying new things beyond my reach. Also knowing that I could fail and not letting those failures define me, but rather teach me to continuing on in this road of life. So um, just, been, just been pushing. I mean, would, you, would you differentiate or do you differentiate between the resilience required to get through say a physical treatment or a surgery versus the resilience required to keep on through the larger arc of your life or your goals or your intentions. Would you say that there's any division there or how are they the same or what, what's your take it's, on that? 
it's all it's every day is a story every story is a moment has a moment every day has a moment every day is a moment in life so no matter how small no matter how large the obstacle whether it is medical academic physical emotional social economical um we all have barriers right so we just have to what i really love to adapt is adopt is a adjust and adapt i mean we've we've had physical obstacles both you and i right so it's just a bump in the road right so and it's a teaching moment and it gives us experience to have more confidence as the road comes to us yeah so. I think I also would like to kind of <clears throat> um, reinforce that and say that um, in my experience, I grew up as I came to the United States as an immigrant, uh, as a child who was here from another country. And I am um, of a, a minority ethnic group in terms of being uh, Jewish. And I also um, ran into some of the things that you just kind of touched on briefly, which was like some social rejection and some people making decisions about you based on things that aren't really about your deeper you. Right. Um, you know, some challenges that come to you socially uh, from being uh, in an out group. Um, things that I know a lot of people out there would probably resonate with being the new kid and moving a lot. Right. Um, I had a lot of that. And also, that children of immigrants uh, are used to that experience of having their parents working all the time and they kind of become adultified very early on and have to take these very adult responsibilities early on in life because their parents are so busy making ends meet. And I'm sure that that experience echoes to people who are in poverty and people who have uh, the economic challenges that you mentioned. Yeah. So I agree with you that each time we have to adjust and adapt, Right. Um, you know, we become more resilient and more flexible and more able to cope. Yeah. Um, and so to that end, let's go ahead and open the book to chapter one. And I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen with you all. And we are just gonna go ahead and um, go through to chapter one, which is acceptance. And so, um, Chris, you wrote here, of all the values in life that I hold close, I believe acceptance is the dearest to my being, whether it was as a third grader trying to integrate into a mainstream classroom or the first time writer in a week long statewide bike ride with other athletes, I find the component of acceptance a very vital theme of survival in my story. And I want to share with you something that surprised me recently about somebody reading this and reading this book. Um, a friend of mine uh, read this and started talking to me about acceptance from the perspective of who he accepts and whether or not the people around him or the situations around him are situations that he accepts. And I was so used to in this chapter thinking about it in terms of how we feel about whether or not we're being accepted that I think I love the fact that it goes in that mirror way of both directions. What do we accept and reject and who accepts or what accepts and rejects us? Right. So I just kind of want to get um, your take on when did this construct of acceptance as being sort of one of the first pieces of pavement that you step on to be resilient, how does that play out for you? What does that mean for you? When does acceptance come to mind as you're facing a challenge? Um. Every, just simply going to social gatherings, simply going to special events, uh, simply stepping into a classroom in which I wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, let alone, I mean, special day class is a challenge. I mean, even for the people with different abilities, I mean, and special needs. I mean, I wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, here I am. I'm. I'm a, supposed to be a dad baby at birth, right? So um, I'm taking every moment as an accepted piece of gift, a gift. And um, every accomplishment is like the bow on top of that gift, right? Like completing that, completing that, um, that bike ride, going on the cruise, 
getting a whole, getting a medal or a ribbon in special Olympics. That's a gift. Um, being able to simply showing up is my acceptance. It's my sense of acceptance because, yeah, people can talk, people could walk, but they can't do my talk and walk. So let it let it be known I'm here. So, yeah, and had a, had a had a very dear um um had a, an awakening of acceptance about eight years ago. I was just doing some work training for uh work, and one of the, a bunch of them centered around harassment and discrimination and da 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 and I'm like, oh, I'm totally doing the discrimination, the last one, because I'm like, I have a story to tell. And it revolved around my neighborhood McDonald's in which I was with a group of my friends and a imbecile, a so-called imbecile was just taping our table specifically just and quote it, and then, you know, I hate the word, I just wanted to record how retards eat. I was like, mm, yeah, let's have this discussion here. And hit the high road, asked him to delete it, then delete it, came back later, found out that he was wanted by the officers. And I was like, in a, mo in a moment in which combat or violence could be easily the answer, I often choose the high road and just say they don't know they don't understand they they're mis misinformed they need to be educated and little but no pity on them because they refuse to integrate with what's modern right so yeah i, I think that. Uh, that 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 speaks to a, one of my favorite authors and one of my heroes my literary heroes albert camus he stated that all evil is a result of ignorance and that no one with real awareness and real information and real um, knowledge would ever choose to harm others or harm the world around them because they understand that that's harming themselves. Yeah. And so his, his idea that the cure for our malevolent behavior, the cure for our poor choices, for our bad behavior is always increasing our knowledge and awareness and raising our consciousness and that that is how we get people to move from a place of being policed by rules to being self-charged with right. doing right right, right. Yeah. and i think that's very true i'd like to talk a little bit about acceptance in terms of my diagnosis because i think that there's a lot to be said for just accepting the situation that you enter into and just saying, this is this, this is what's going on. This is, this belongs, this is how it is. And for those of you who might be wondering why I'm wearing this sling right now, um, my cancer metastasized to my bone and I was out in the front yard and I took a misstep and fell and broke my arm. And I found myself once again, despite the, you know, the first initial diagnosis and then progressing forward and finding out that my cancer was stage four. And then, you know, two years later, finding out that the medications stopped working and it had breakthrough metastases. Um, and then on top of all that, breaking my arm. So each time I came into a new chapter of my experiences and my dance with cancer, I had to come to a new level of acceptance. This is the time frame I'm in. This is the timeline I'm in. This is how it is now. And I need to adapt and adjust to that, not bemoan the fact that I'm not on a different timeline that I would prefer to be on. Right. right? You sort of <laughs> just have to accept the parts that you are dealt with. Yeah. And so one of the things I'd like us to do now is to read um, one of your poems. If you could please, I'll put it up on screen. You can read it for our listeners. But I want to um, share the idea that Chris's poetry has embedded within it with the way that he writes a kind of acceptance of the difficulties, the messiness, the stuff we don't like, the stuff we don't want. And yet the, it, it still exhorts you to be resilient, still exhorts you to reach into what you can look at, to smile about, still exhorts you to move forward and through. And so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen and have Christopher 
read the first um, poem that we have here. It's called Acceptance is Awkward. So Chris, if you could go ahead and read that for us, that'd be great. After so long debating my new change, I've come to know acceptance is awkward. No matter where it affects one life's range, all one can go is upward and onward. Being told to adjust and still stand up is just a testimonial of strength. For acceptance is awkward, like a grump who only knows their troubles and fears only. Positive or negative, there's one fact, and that is this. Acceptance is awkward. So dwell so short and then accept changes packed for life is way too short to move backward. So know what does not kill you truly does make you stronger in your spirit and mind. Since survival outshines failure's weak buzz, yet acceptance is awkward, yet so blind. So when life's direction is all jagged and inside out, just accept what's given. For up and down in zigzag goes life's thread while acceptance is awkward by sin's grin. Like a strange melody makes music rhythm complete. Acceptance is awkward, yet makes lives have true speed. So I really appreciate the profundity of that expression. And I think that poem speaks to what we've been talking about. I'm gonna go ahead and direct uh, anybody's view, viewer, anybody who's viewing, I'm gonna direct your attention to the page two here, which is the exercise that I put together to help people sort of cogitate and think about how acceptance is playing out in our lives. For those of you who are just listening and can't see the visual, or if you happen to be visual, low vision or visually impaired, there's a spiral shape on the page. And along the spiral are some sentences that go from the outside to the inside. So beginning in the outside, this spiral of acceptance says, well, you feel tolerated more than accepted. And then as you spiral in, you find well, maybe you feel accepted about half the time, but can't really be myself. And then the next loop on the spiral is maybe you feel accepted enough, but I work to fit in. And then finally, at the very heart of the spiral is feel fully accepted almost all of the time. And as I said, when we started our talk about this chapter, um, I want everyone to notice that you have both of those roles. You all, you have the role that the spiral describes of how you feel relative to others accepting or not accepting you. But then you're also the person who can create and offer acceptance to others. And we all live on both sides of that line. So one of the things that this exercise helps you do is consider the list of people and places that you go. Where on this spiral would you place these people in terms of your sense of being accepted by them? Does this change? How about your self-acceptance? How frequently and complete is your acceptance of others? And so I encourage you to consider yourself, your family members, partners, friends, peers, coworkers, community members, you know, how accepting or, you know, editing are you of different individuals in your life and how accepted or edited by them do you feel? And then locations, what environments make you feel fully accepted and comfortable? What environments make you work a little bit harder to fit in? What environments make you feel like, well, I'm here, I'm tolerated. One of the things that's interesting to me is our sense of acceptance in public versus private places, right? And then there's these semi-public private places where we go, where we know some people, but not everyone. And so those are all considerations because we sort of constantly call it, calibrate. Am I, is it okay to be myself here or do I have to put on more of a front? Is it okay to be my natural responses here or do I have to be careful and show only the responses I think people expect? And we all kind of do that to some degree, but the more we can accept others, the more accepted we tend to feel, right? And wouldn't it be nice to have other people think of us as someone who accepts them and someone who makes them feel accepted, right? right? So sure. that an ideal. That said, let's go ahead and take a look at the next page. We'll just kind of take a look here. And um, <clears throat> this is something that I um, particularly would like people 
to consider as part of the practice of acceptance is the practice, doing it over again, looking at it again. And so I have this exercise in here called meta life, life meta skill, RE, re, reframe, refocus, reinterpret, reposition, reimagine, remove, reintegrate, redress, remodel. And the prompt here in this exercise is look at your experience, perception, emotional state through both ends of the telescope, up close and backed out. Get good at switching views. Get good at looking things up close and far away. How do they see me? How do I see me? How do I see them? How will it change tomorrow? How will it change in 10 minutes? We happen over time. We are multiple versions of ourselves and we are all experiencing multiple versions of each other. And so understanding this helps us accept that there's a balance that happens over time as we go through these different iterations of ourselves from day to day, from moment to moment. As Chris mentioned earlier, every moment is as part of the story. And so to that end, I think this poem that Chris wrote called From a Telescope Far Away helps us have maybe a little bit of more of a cosmological perspective, which can help us calm down about those details in the moment. Would you mind reading that poem for us, Chris? Sure. From a telescope far away, somewhere in the stars or far galaxies, there is a telescope with no focus and sees a picture of all souls and seeds with no trace of indifference or fuss. Yeah, from a distance that needs no zoom lenses, we are all a nice family portrait, free of constraints and meannesses, shameful sense while making all dots of prejudice faint. Imperfections may exist somewhere or far, but from a telescope sight far away, all of them are blurred along with paint scars. For all the telescope sees is Tetra's ray, a collage of color of people that are all sizes and shapes from her herbs everywhere. That is what we can one can see from Pluto's star. Yet one gets up so close, yet life's run by fear. Yeah, when the pixels of everyday life get magnified, arrogance and hurts cloud hangs over many as they strive for choice rife, while unity's hopes fade and sing rings loud. From a telescope far away, there is a picture with hand-brushed beauty, yet as one investigates so closely, harsh is living reality. Thank you, that's really nicely spoken. So I think that's a really good place for folks to start with chapter one. Yeah. Um, acceptance is accepting what you've got, accepting who you are, accepting where you are, basically accepting the intersection of time and circumstances and yourself and your awareness your character role your right. role in, yeah. in, in both your road and your own road and as to the big picture which you really don't have control over right. because you have to we are all dealt with issues challenges every day not to be and not to pass judgment on others and want to control others that that's not what we're here for our purpose is to be living not to be worried or fearing or judging yeah but i think also accepting. i think also the acceptance of your circumstances helps you just move right because yep. if you get preoccupied with non-acceptance. Non-acceptance can be very distracting, right? Yep. If we tell ourselves, this isn't supposed to be, I'm not supposed to be coping with this. This shouldn't have happened. If we get very preoccupied with that. And you it takes up time that you could be using on bettering yourself or helping you strengthen your inner self, like your diagnosis, like your cancer, but tra travesty. Um, the more you fear, the less you have time to live. 
Exactly, exactly. So, so if we accept something, then we can just live into it. We can just right. move into it and live through it, yeah, right? Exactly. But if we're if we let our brain kind of convince us that what's happening is not supposed to be, or that somebody's behavior is not supposed to be, or that you know that's where the suffering comes in, and that's where we get stuck is if we're not willing to just say, okay, this is what I have. I'm going to work with what I have, right? For sure, that's definitely. So it's good talking to you, Chris, and we'll do chapter two next. All right. And guys, take a look through the book. I'm going to share screen one more time and just show you some of the other exercises and um, poems that you can enjoy from the book. So um, in this one, we continued looking at that re, you know, doing it again, and how, how can you investigate all the different versions and, and repetitions of yourselves and others. And then um, we have a, an exercise for when you're out walking or, or using your wheelchair or riding your bike that helps you kind of build some resilience and acceptance. Um, we have two more poems that are really powerful and very insightful. And then some thoughts about accessing um, your, your political savvy and your political power in terms of acceptance and non-acceptance. And thinking about, okay, we can't, there are things in the world that our value system and our ethics will say, no, I can't accept that, right? I can't allow that, or I can't endorse that. It doesn't mean you don't accept that it's real and it's happening, but you can go ahead and go out against it and say, you know what? That's something that needs to change. And saying that something needs to change is not the same as saying, I don't think it exists or I'm not accepting it, right? right. Once you accept it, then you can start working to make it different. And that's um, a critical piece a of that. There's quite a difference in the moment that you accept it because that moment is the moment you can start working at bettering your circumstances instead of bemoaning it or fearing what could have been. Exactly, exactly. So, so we're very excited to share these chapter workthroughs and discussions with you. Yeah. And we look forward to hearing from you. Please check the webpage poeticabilities.com and reallearning.net for where you can purchase the book, Resilience, and we'll put those in the link. Um, and thank you very much for your time and support and help. Be kind to one another. <laughs>